As we always do, I want to thank all of you for giving up an evening and joining us here for our regular program series. I would like you to thank and introduce our board of directors who are here and they can answer any questions you have at the end of the program. So you don't have to stand necessarily because the board of directors wave their hands for people to see who they are. So excellent. Um, I hesitate to call it a membership drive, but we had our membership mailing uh, late in 2016 and it's still going on. Uh, so if you are a member and you paid your dues for this year, I, we want to thank you very, very much. If you are a member and you have not paid your dues this year, tonight's a perfect opportunity. We have people in the back row back there that will be very willing to help you pay a variety of different ways. If you're not a member and are thinking of becoming a member, we encourage you to do so. And same deal, visit the people in the back tables and they will help you become a member. And if you are not a member and don't want to be a member, you're still welcome tonight. Enjoy the program and I will work with you to change your mind. Um, Whether you're a member or not, it, uh, these programs don't happen for free, so it does cost the society a modest stipend to put them on. If you'd like to help defray the costs of putting these programs on, there's a little donation jar in the back, and on the way out, you can throw a few dollars if you'd like. Um, we are continually on the lookout for new docents for our bungalow next to Whole Foods. If you have an interest in being taught the history of the bungalow and would like to take a shift every now and then, Ed Stork in the front row would love to talk to you. Um, I want to announce this every meeting that we've been looking for a while for a permanent home for our archives in the city. Uh, the bungalow, which is our headquarters, doesn't really qualify as an archive storage type device. So if anybody knows of a possible home for our archives and for us to move into. We're always all ears. Contact me or any board member. Be happy to talk about it. And lastly, I invite you. Our Facebook page has had a lot of activity lately. Uh, big kudos to Johanna Ellis for all the hard work she does on that. If you're not following us on Facebook, I guarantee it would be a great addition to your following. A lot of great pictures and a lot of just good information. And uh, on, as well as our website, our website continually is upgraded and has some very, very good information on there. So feel free to visit the website frequently. Our program tonight, and I don't want to mess it up, so I have our newsletter, which if you're a member, you get for free. And in the newsletter, it says that the Committee for the Preservation of the Laguna Legacy is here to share the story of the newly designated title given to our town, Histor Laguna Beach Historical American Landscape. Um, the committee uh, was able to achieve this by being very strong, and you can see why behind me. There are some very important influential people back behind me who worked very, very hard on this, and they'll be giving you their story. Uh, the chair is behind me is Ron Chilcote. Ron taught in the Department of Economics and Political Science at University of Riverside, and when he was there, received the Distinguished Teaching Award. He was the founder of the American, uh, the acad academic journal Latin America Perspectives, and the author of more than 200 other academic publications. Uh, to show you the kind of scholar he is, he has donated over 12,000 books to the UCR library, including many rare books and periodicals. But most importantly, he has been deeply involved in conservation and wilderness campaigns throughout California, and of course, especially here in Laguna Beach. He's the founder of the Laguna Wilderness Press and of Nature's Laguna's Wilderness. He has expertly combined his environmental activism with his work as a landscape and nature photographer effectively using his photography to pr promote our local preservation. So join me in a very enthusiastic Laguna Beach Historical Society welcome to Ron Chilcote.
Thank, thank you, Greg. Uh, what a pleasure to be with you tonight uh, to celebrate this uh, great honor for our community. Uh, having uh, received recognition of, of Laguna Beach and its green belt as a historic, as American, historic American landscape, part of the Historic American Landscape Survey uh, in a process that is overseen by the National Park Service. And uh, with the documentation that we put together was submitted through the Library of Congress. So this is a national recognition, national honor, and we're here to celebrate it. We also wanted to, to uh, bring together the results of our efforts into a book, which you've seen on the screen a, a minute ago, and we'll be talking about that and how we put it together. It was uh, when I first moved into Laguna Beach in 1972, I immediately found myself working alongside uh, Jim Dilley, the founder of the Green Belt, who had this great vision of establishing a Green Belt around Laguna Beach. He learned about it in a visit to Europe, to, to England in particular, and uh, uh, this great vision is what shaped the Green Belt through the years and had led to such uh, an important outcome in which we've conserved some 22,000 acres of land around us. The, uh, the images you were just looking at a minute ago uh, showed uh, the green belt. Oh, now we're on the map. <laughs> yeah, that's right in front of you. Okay. Uh, the, the first images were of the uh, two images of the green belt, one, uh, one that showed Mount Baldy reflected in the Vernal Lake that you can see today with water in it, and the other uh, a picture of Little Sycamore Canyon, and this is at the foot of Little Sycamore Canyon where we now have the Nick Center that uh, was created to, to open up the park to, to the public at large uh, at the turn of the century. And the other two images below are images of the blue belt, but the blue belt is also part of the green belt. And uh, the, the image in the lower left is an image of uh, King Tide at a time uh, when the water is lowest and highest. And it's very unusual to be able to see the tide pools in this part of the beaches up in the northern part of town. And the other one is a bird rock, which was uh, recognized in January as part of the National Coastal National Monument. Um, and you, you're all familiar with it, but it's, uh, it's part of that monument today. The genesis, uh, genesis of our project uh, began back in 2009 when Noel Vernon, Vernon of Cal Poly came to town and had a discussion with Ann Kristoff and others about the possibility of a historic American landscape survey designation for Laguna Beach and its, its green belt. Uh, because of the focus on dramatic and scenic landscape and its evolution as an art colony with the tradition of environmental awareness and protection that we have all shared over the years. And roughly three years ago, Anne approached me about carrying such a project to the Laguna Greenbelt. And we, I went to the board, we discussed it, there was enthusiasm, and three of us on the board uh, then helped organize this committee of nine people. And we met over a period of about three years to put together the documentation and the photography um, that uh, justifies the project that we submitted. We call ourselves the Committee for the Preservation of the Laguna Legacy, and I wanted to introduce the committee members. Uh, first, uh, Bob Borthwick is to my left. He's a board member of the Laguna Greenbelt, and uh, you know him recently for his plan to restore Laguna Canyon Creek. 
and especially our our map of the green belt which is available out there for sale if if you're interested in it. it's the latest version of the green belt it's very complete and we work very hard on it uh, mark chamberlain is to my right and uh, you know mark probably for the famous uh, 1989 tell that we erected in the canyon and you see it on the window as you enter into the Nick Center. And Mark is just completing a book on Laguna Canyon, which includes all of its history and its photography. And Laguna Wilderness Press uh, expects to have that book out by the summer. And it will fill a very interesting and important gap in our, in our history. And Christoph is to his right. And I think you know her as a former mayor and council person, activist in town, landscaper, uh, always involved in architect. landscape architect, landscape architect, of course, and who has been involved in this project in every phase, and uh, with her persistency has has driven us forward to its completion. Harry Huggins. Here to my left is a former county um, and head of Parks Harbor Parks. Let's see, Parks Harbor Harbors Parks and Recreation. OC Parks, Orange County, and. Harry was very instrumental in bringing together some historical information and some maps that have helped us fill out the story that we tell in both our documentation and the book. Uh, Eric Jessen, also retired from as a county administrator, is uh, his main role in this project has been uh, providing his knowledge and understanding of plain air painting, which is a very important ingredient of our legacy. And uh, he'll be talking about that tonight. Tom Lamb here is uh, responsible for our photography. He laid out most of the book that we put together. He has been uh, furthermore involved, he was involved in the original legislation which passed by Congress Establish the Hell's designation. Barbara Metzger, a former member of the Planning Commission, uh, was particularly important to us in organizing the writing of our story and uh, the editing that went into it. Verna Rollinger, our beloved longtime city clerk and former board member and mayor um, is here. Barbara is here. I'm sorry I didn't point her out to you. And Verna uh, stood in my stead when I wasn't available to keep the project moving ahead over the years. Allison Terry is the representative, is the Southern California representative of the Hells, and she's here. And she attended most of our meetings and, and guided us through this, this very long process. We wanted also to thank uh, a number of organizations. I don't know if you can read those, but I'll just quickly uh, identify them. The Foundation for Sustainability and Innovation, the Laguna Green Belt, uh, the Laguna Wilderness Press, Lance Valerie Studio, South Laguna Civic Association, the Temple Hills Community Association, the Laguna Blue Belt Coalition, Village Laguna, and the art collections of the City of Laguna Beach, the Festival of Arts, and the Laguna Art Museum. Uh, it's, um, if, if you're interested in the book that we put together with the map there, available in the back, and I'm going to turn this over to, to uh, uh, who's next? Allison. Allison. Oh, yeah, Al Allison, who's going to tell us about Hells. 
You have to press. Okay. okay. Um, so HAL stands for Historic American Landscape Survey. His, historic places are special places. They're important touchstones of national, regional, and local identity. They foster a sense of community and place. Historic landscapes are also fragile places. They are affected by the forces of nature and by commercial and residential development, vandalism, and neglect. They undergo changes that are often unpredictable and irreversible. For these reasons and for the benefit of future generations, it is important to document these places. HAL's primary, HAL, HAL's primary goal is to provide a lasting record of landscapes that reflects the types, periods, and patterns of landscape development indicative of our varied American culture. The uh, Heritage Documentation Programs is uh, part of the National Park Service, and they administer HALS, HABS, and HAIR. And as you can see up on the slide here, the first uh, program that was instituted was in 1933, the Historic American Building Survey. And uh, HALS is the most recent one. So um, it was, the legislation was enabled in 2000, but uh, the tripartite agreement was not um, was not set up until 2010, so it's a very young program. But we're really excited to have Laguna Beach as part of the program now. So um, it was a tripartite agreement set up by the American Society of Landscape Architects, of which I'm, I'm part, the National Park Service, and the Library of Congress. So the agreement was to document historic landscapes to serve as tangible evidence of our nation's heritage and development. And the uh, HABS Hair and HALS collection is distinguished in its national scope, consistent format, archival stability, and continued growth. Over 40,000 historic sites are maintained in a special collection in the Prints and Photographs Division of the Library of Congress and are available to the public copyright free, both in hard copy and digital formats. Every documentation contributes to wider recognition and appreciation of our historic resource. Documentation produced through these programs constitutes the nation's largest archive of historical architectural engineering and landscape documentation. Since it's gone online, it's one of the most popularly searched collections at the Library of Congress. Due to its high level of academic and technical accuracy, the written and graphic records of our nation's treasures is of interest to educators, scholars, professionals, land managers, preservation planners, and the general public. HELS documentation packages are of value for scholarly research, site interpretation, public education, and as blueprints if the resources are damaged or destroyed. So on these slides, you can see some examples of uh, some HELS projects that have been documented. And you can see the high level of, uh, of technical drawing that's exhibited here. And for the uh, Laguna Beach HALS report, the, the emphasis at this point was on um, the, the uh, actual written report. And HALS uh, puts an emphasis on trying to encapsulate the integrity of the sites um, through the written word. So uh, we're hoping in the future that, that multiple projects will be born out of this initial project. Uh, let's see. So appropriate landscapes. So um, identifying historic landscapes is, is uh, we want to look for landscapes that are at least 50 years old and they're historically significant and there's there's some categories and it will be on the next slide which that which are the um, historically significant categories but they need to possess integrity in location design setting materials workmanship feeling and association and laguna beach has integrity in all of these and uh Hells likes to uh put an emphasis on landscapes documenting landscapes that are threat that may be threatened as well um, and uh, so they are a representative of a, um, a common or a familiar landscape. So here we're showing um, the four criteria for significance, and Laguna Beach meets all of these. So uh, you, 
I don't need to go through all of these, but just uh, you'll hear from the rest of the group and they'll talk about all the different significant uh, things about Laguna Beach. So now we'll start to talk about how Laguna Beach fits into this picture. And we're going to show how the landscape relates to the following history that went on. So we had a very beautiful, distinctive landscape, which then attracted artists. The artists started to build our culture and build our town, and our town responded to the landscape as it developed. And so we ended up with this very unique city and its surroundings. Next. So that is the uh, Greenbelt map, and it shows how the Greenbelt encompasses most of the very mountainous topography uh, that surrounds Laguna Beach. And this is a typical picture of our natural landscape that we so much treasure. And how the town fits into it is a key part of this story. So this is a picture of the Laguna Beach landscape prior to the construction of Coast Highway in 1926. And this gives you an idea about where it is. The, it's taken from behind or south of Aliso Canyon, looking north. And Big Bend is way in the back. But you can see how the Laguna Beach, San Joaquin Hills are really almost like an island in the sea of Orange County, which is pretty much all very low rolling hills or almost flat. So this was a very unusual anomaly in terms of the landscape of this region even. And because of that, the ranchers when they, or the, when the Spanish came, uh, were not that interested in dealing with the Laguna Beach area. And so it didn't become a part of the ranchos. This is a map of the ranchos in Orange County and the colored in the various colors of yellow. Those were different ranches, Rancho San Joaquin, Rancho Niguel, and then the, the Mission, um, which is shown in white. But basically the Laguna Beach Triangle there in the middle of that circle, the next slide, um, was not claimed by anyone. And it was left until the 1860s when President Lincoln started the Homestead Act. That was still considered government land ready to be homesteaded. And because of that, the homesteading, here you see that same triangle again. And uh, Beryl Wilson Vebeck did this map that recorded where those homesteads ended up. So the lines of that, the boundaries of that triangle go from north to south and east to west, regardless of the topography. So the challenge that, that the different owners of these homesteads faced was, how do I do something with this square, but yet there's all this undulation underneath the square that I've been given as part of my homestead? And those different squares pass down from one owner to the next, but always kind of keeping that configuration because that's what they got. And that led to every one of these parts being developed in a little bit different way. And so we, we can see that now in the different parts of our community. Some, there are two streets, uh, Park Avenue and West Street in South Laguna that go directly east and west. And, most, and those correspond to some of the lines on this map that divided one homestead from another. And other than that, most of the rest of the roads relate to the topography. So uh, we have a landscape that re resulted in um, squares being applied to a very un undulating landscape 
and we responded to it, and we have, that's part of what has made our, our city so unique. It also led the artists to come here. I mean, that was the first uh, cultural thing after the Native Americans um, to happen. And so the artists started to set the tone for how Laguna Beach was going to become, as well as these homestead lines. And the homesteaders also had to prove up their claims, and they did that by planting eucalyptus. And so there were groves of eucalyptus in various areas of the town, which started to change the scenery and started to change the landscape. And it was these trees and the landscape and the ocean that the early artists became known to paint. So the, the um, that leads to what happened with our plein air painters and how they influenced uh, the further development of the town because it was their artistic sense then that led to the kind of architecture we started to have. And uh, Frank Cooperian, for example, one of the prominent plein air painters, designed the Chamber of Commerce building because he wanted to be sure that it was going to be artistic and it was going to fit into town. And Eric's going to tell us more about the plein air painters. Uh, yeah, we're just going to look at a few representative examples. This particular canvas by Joseph Kleitsch, entitled uh, Laguna Coastline, is actually the painting that was selected uh, on the cover of the book, available in the back of the room. Um, the arroyo down here in the bottom, uh, and by the way, I've made arrangements. It's the camera for the TV broadcast is on this screen so that the pointer can be used on that screen. This is where Riddle Field is constructed in the Pavilion Shopping Center. Uh, these two houses still stand on Hawthorne at Monterey. Um, this is Myrtle Street. The Laguna Art Museum is located right about in this area. Main Beach is visible right here. Um, Goff Island, formerly Treasure Island, and the Montage here. Three Arch Bay built on that peninsula and the Dana Point headlands. Next. Thank you. Here we have uh, um, a classic image uh, again by Joseph Kleitsch, called the White House, depicting the White House restaurant. Kleitsch was um, a fairly short-lived artist that arrived here in the late teens and died in 1930. And he became very alarmed by how quickly the town was changing, starting to change in the mid-20s, and basically dedicated a great deal of his uh, effort in town to r racing around and painting canvases depicting the town and trying to capture images before things changed. This is uh, uh, entitled Laguna Beach and Third Street Hill uh, Street. It was built right down here off of Park Avenue. And so we're in downtown. The pepper tree in front of City Hall is just off the, the canvas right here. The senior center is in this area. Laguna Avenue and Forest are coming down this way. Next, Virginia Woolley's House by the Sea, which is uh, in the Woods Cove area, still standing today on the ocean front. Uh, Eternal Surge by Edgar Payne, um, a canvas that is owned by the Laguna Art Museum now. Uh, this was uh, when I gave my Edgar Payne project a number of years ago. Uh, this was a central feature because this one took four years to solve to find the right combination of rocks awash in the shore to match what is in the canvas. Uh, by 1920, uh, Payne's canvases, which were generally fairly large, were selling uh, between four and five thousand dollars, which was a huge amount of money at that time. He was very successful because he armed himself with two pieces of equipment that most of the artists couldn't afford, a good automobile and a good camera. Next, uh, Laguna Beach by Joseph Kleitsch depicts the notch entering Laguna Canyon. Uh, the pepper tree uh, where City Hall is today is in the back here. 
This is Laguna Creek, the center line of which divided the Rancho San Joaquin and the Irvine uh, ranch lands to the north and the homesteaded lands to the south. These buildings are um, generally parallel to what we would call Ocean Avenue today, although Jane Jans has told us that there was a, a street here by uh, uh, a, a different name, at, uh, and I don't remember the name of that, that street. And then finally, uh, the Old Coast Road by William Went, uh, which has been the subject of uh, a lot of uh, activity and attention lately. And not only that, but it was the featured opening screen in Greg and Barg McGillivray's program at Laguna Canyon Foundation a week ago yesterday. Um, this painting was acquired by the Jarrus family that founded Laguna Lumber Company from uh, William went in 1916 when the paint was still wet on the canvas in return for lumber, hardware, toilets, sinks, and other materials that were used by William Went and his wife Julia Bracken in building their studio, which was located right about here. This is the Ibbotson house that stood for generations right next door to the Villa Rockledge, which was built here. This is Moss Point. Uh, the Jarrises are um, a rather private family, and, and they don't really relish making trips to Los Angeles. They like to stay in town, uh, at least from my experience. Uh, and because of that, it fell on me to coordinate the sale of the Old Coast Road on their behalf at Bonham's on Sunset Boulevard. Um, it was a very electrifying night when the, uh, when the canvas was up for auction. Uh, there were uh, one party in the audience and four on the phone, and the bidding uh, got underway, and after, oh, it was almost a half hour long, when the gavel fell, the painting sold for $1.6 million, and uh, is the, uh, the highest price on record for this type of work uh, in the auction industry. We hope to do a program on the saga of this painting uh, in the centennial celebration for the Laguna Art Museum next year. Barbara, you're up next. Thank you. The plein air painters helped spread the word about the beauty of Laguna. And from the beginning, residents took every opportunity to preserve and enhance it. In January 1925, the Women's Club launched a campaign to make Laguna Beach the paradise of the Pacific. Distributing 700 Monterey cypress trees for planting on Arbor Day with the goal of what it called helping put Laguna Beach to the fore as a bower of loveliness and a hillside of grandeur. The landscape architect Florence York recommended planting thousands of trees and provided a list of trees that would, work, that would do well in Laguna. In 1933, a three-member park and tree board was given free reign in handling all matters having to do with street trees and the vegetation in parks. Photographs of newly built houses in the Laguna Spirit were often featured in the pages of the newspaper, along with renderings and floor plans of houses suitable for Laguna. The new headquarters of the Chamber of Commerce, built in 1925, was, as Anne said, designed by the painter Frank, Frank Cuprian to harmonize with the natural beauties of the town. <clears throat> when incorporation as a city began to be talked about, Cuprian argued that it would permit creating a building code to control the look of the town as it grew. After its incorporation, the city's first improvement project was a comprehensive sewage treatment system. And in February 1931, the South Coast News printed a rendering of the proposed building that it said, had caused several people who didn't like the idea of a plant of this nature being erected in Laguna Canyon to change their ideas. The headline read, New Laguna Sewage Treatment Plant is Attractive in Design. <laughs> Concerns in the 30s that some improvements were detracting from Laguna's natural beauty led to the passage of three urgency ordinances that established separate zones for residences and for business. The city's first land use plan, adopted in 1940, included restriction on the height and bulk of buildings and the amount of space around them. 
the city's general plan adopted in 1959 included among its goals that the physical beauty of the area, especially of the coastline, should be preserved. And it called for keeping residential and commercial development in the central area low, consistent with the established character of Laguna. When the Planning Commission proposed a maximum building height of 50 feet in January 1971, a citizens group circulated petitions for an initiative that would limit buildings citywide to 36 feet. And on election day, 62% of registered voters turned out and 75% of them voted yes. In the course of the 70s, the city developed other ways of preserving its unique character, including the land use and open space elements of the general plan, a heritage tree ordinance and an inventory of historic resources that identified more than 700 houses eligible for listing on the, historic, the city's historic register. Some 300 no homes are now protected by such listing. To implement all these policies, the city began requiring design review of proposed development in 1972, and eventually, in response to neighborhood concerns about out-of-scale development, extended the requirement to residences in 1986. The downtown specific plan adopted in 1989 was designed to protect the downtown's eclectic mix of architectural styles, small scale buildings, pedestrian orientation, variety of shops and services, and sense of community. A planning process called Vision 2030, involving some 2,000 residents, concluded in 2001 that Lagunans accept the responsibility of stewardship for the town we love, for both its people and its environment, and are willing to commit to its preservation and enhancement. Where's my last page? It's there. Throughout the city's history, its physical setting with an enclosed downtown where residents often meet face to face has contributed to its sense of community. And this is reflected in the proliferation of homegrown community organizations in the arts and in social services, and in the community's wholehearted, compassionate response to victims of our periodic natural disasters. This is the link between landscape and community that the Historic American Landscape Survey records and celebrates. Who's next? Good evening. Oh. Now I can say good evening. As Ron referenced at the beginning tonight, uh, we actually can't talk about the Green Belt without mentioning uh, this great man, Jim Dilley. Uh, he was a man of persistence and determination for which we should be grateful. We probably wouldn't be here. A local bookseller, Dilley's Bookstore, resident of Laguna, inspired others around him to form Laguna Green Belt, Inc. He got the city thinking about the surrounding land uses and talked the Board of Supervisors into putting the open space into a long-term plan. And as you know, you can't do much with the county, it's such a big ship, but he did. I'm proud of that. Uh, his healthy seeds of wisdom never really withered. It grew to 22,000 acres, which are now surrounding the Greenbelt. I think there's a map. There we go. Uh, it has been my pleasure to work with the County of Orange, OC Parks, defending the boundaries and processing additional lands since 1990, until I retired three years ago. It has been a very smart strategy on the county and the city's part to have several different adjacent owners of all the lands to protect the lands and repel away the pressures of development. Driving out the canyon, one did not miss the impact of the tell. Mark Chamberlain and Jerry Birchfield and all of the many protesters gathered each day along the road fighting the proposed Laguna Laurel development. It was also my pleasure before working at the county to work with a Laguna artist activist, Charles Michael Murray. His marketing skills and my skills in public relations, we organized and delivered The Walk in Laguna Canyon, November 11th, 1989. The debate about whether it was 8,000 people or 11,000 still goes on. We don't know. Uh, 
It's been the largest environmental protest march ever held in the county. We had made a proposal for the walk in September of uh, 1989 at the LCC meeting on the third floor of the Wells Fargo Bank. I swear they were debating and complaining about Xeroxing costs and weren't getting anywhere. We felt sorry for them. Within 90 days, everyone was on it. The city followed with full support at every level, the business community, including realtors, city staff, and of course, an active city council led by Lita Lenny. As Mark will assure you, and again, I misquote him, uh, you, uh, now and has proven to thousands of people in the past, art can make us see more and understand the world. We all know from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. But what is it that uh, lives on for our children, our friends, and uh, a few of those occasional visitors, tourists, we call them, uh, how do we calculate the values retained and what we've protected out there? Is it the groves of sycamores at the Dilly Preserve nestled below the hillsides adjacent to the toll road? Uh, or is it the meadows of the Laurel Canyon surrounded by the outrageous rock outcroppings? Or is it that lone beautiful tree survive again, surviving against all odds in Ma Mathis Canyon? Little Sycamore, where the Nick's Nature Center is located, to not have removed the most valuable sensitive habitat there and still got the Nick's Nature Center put in. Trump's uh, to the county for having done that. A walk around the natural lakes in the canyon, the sound of the birds, the flowering cactus, the smell of the habitat at dawn or at sunset. The walk in the woods is right outside our door here. We can ride our bikes to get there. The success of the Greenbelt is inseparable from the success of Laguna Beach. As one is dependent upon the other and for their long-term protection and planning. From the coastline along Crystal Cove State Beach featured here to the wandering wildlife corridor that will reach the Cleveland National Forest, it takes an active group of concerned citizens to protect and preserve the rights we have gained in the struggles so far. I hope you will, in any way you can, uh, consider providing uh, the book that we've published or somehow refer people to protecting the property around Laguna Canyon. Uh, that being said, I'd like to turn it to Bob. I'm the last speaker here, so I'll be uh, brief and we'll start to wrap it up. Uh, this, this slide was one that was taken by Tom Lamb just recently from a helicopter. It's uh, Aliso Canyon, um, and uh, I, I might say here, um, we were so blessed to have Tom and Ron and, and Mark as part of this committee because you know, we couldn't have any better photographs to submit for this project due to their efforts. Um, the Aliso, the one thing I'd just like to say real quickly about Aliso is that um, concurrently with the beginning of Laguna Greenbelt in right around 1970, there was another group that was working on preserving Aliso Canyon. And I, I would happen to be part of that group. And uh, Liso Canyon is a 19-mile stretch from the from the ocean to Cook's Corner in um, in Lake Forest. So, uh, our sister um, canyon in, in Laguna Beach is Liso. So, um, I'd like to say that our our message through all the generations is that Laguna's people have held on to the vision of our town and its surroundings as being treasured. Laguna and its rich history, including both the settling of our town and the protection of our open space, is our collective legacy that belongs to all of us. We wanted to document this history so the story would be preserved <coughs> and future residents and visitors understand what it took and what it will take 
to keep these special qualities that we now enjoy. The need to protect Laguna in its green belt never ends. We appreciate each of you for being here tonight and helping to celebrate this special place that we all are lucky to call home. Thank you. We're happy to have your comments and questions uh, to explore further into what we have presented tonight. Greg? We will ask you to speak into the mic because we're on TV. I'll start the ball rolling. I just want to say, first off, this is the second time I've heard this presentation. And by gosh, it's so interesting and so well done and so beautiful that I could probably listen to it a few more times. <laughs> and the other thing I want to say is that I bought the book the last time. You guys did a fabulous job. It is so well put together. It's coherent. It, you know, it's really an art to put that much information together so gracefully. So, um, you know, just heartiest congratulations. As someone who was raised here, I just want to extend my profound gratitude. Uh, my question is for, I don't you know your name, you're from the Hells, um, right. Are there any other communities uh, that have this kind of unique characteristic that you know of in this country? Does anything, I mean, I know there's nothing like it, but maybe, similarly unique to this, with this, the historic and the geographical characteristics. Thank you. Uh, well, because HALS is a young program, it's, there, there probably are some communities out there that, um, that could be, you know, have a documentation done. Um, I, I don't believe there's one that's been done to this level, though. There have been some smaller smaller places that have been documented but in my not to my knowledge this is the the most comprehensive and the you know the largest area and it's really covering you know not only the topographical features the history you know the art movement you know the environmental movement i mean it's really very comprehensive thank you somebody else What does the designation mean in terms of protection of Laguna into the, into the future? Maybe I missed the, that. So um, HALS is different from the historic register in that it is not an actual designation. Um, so what it is, is it's a tool, it's a research tool, and it's, it's providing all this very accurate data to be preserved in perpetuity in the Library of Congress, and it's copyright free, it's accessible to the public. So um, because it's not involving federal funds and it's not an actual designation, it does not restrict any development. But the, the important thing is that it's really raising the consciousness in the community and nationally to, uh, to the importance of this community and all the different um, portions of, of the community that have dovetailed to, to, you know, that are documented in the report so well. Um, so it, it, what it's doing is it's raising the consciousness. It's it's um, <clears throat> coming, you know, you know, it's it's uh, showing to the state, the the state historic preservation officer, that there's a very viable um, community of preservationists here. So it it's not a designation. It's not protection per se, but it can lead to things if if so desired. Yes. Has, um, I want to compliment you. I rifled through the book, and nowhere is there a dollar sign. And that is so unusual nowadays when describing a community. 
because usually it comes down to the numbers, and the numbers usually mean dollars. But I do want to ask, has anyone ever determined the actual value of the green belt in its entirety? Because I think that that would be a selling point that somebody should have done uh, somewhere along the line, because that's a monumental um, task to have that many entities decide to put aside green space that's not just green space, but you protected it from from what I call the, the, the guys who say, uh, I'm going to take all I can legally get, which is usually the developer, and the community saying, take only what you need. And um, the only way to protect it is to own it. I can uh, help answer the question about the, the dollar value of parkland. Um, when I retired in 2005, I was uh, questioned on that issue extensively in conjunction with a Cal California State University at Fullerton oral history that was being done on my career. And um, we basically... Uh, using the county's uh, regional harbors, beaches, and parks and historic sites system, uh, we had very, very solid numbers because there were values assigned to every uh, uh, parcel of parkland that was dedicated. That's dedicated meaning in return for development entitlements. Uh, and in addition to that, there were obvious, very explicit dollar figures assigned to parcels of parkland that were purchased. And because the government is not allowed to pay more than fair market value for any land based on an appraisal, and if there's disagreement, they go up to three appraisals to get a median price, um, Mile Square Regional Park was an excellent example. Uh, it was uh, valued before the crash of 2008 at, at over $3 million an acre, which meant that the park was worth $1.5 billion. That's Mile Square Regional Park in the middle of, of Fountain Valley. Uh, part of that was predicated on purchase price because part of it was purchased from the federal government. Part of it was predicated on dedication. <clears throat> In the case of Laguna Greenbelt, uh, and, and particularly, let's say, the parcels that were acquired from the Irvine Company, um, I don't remember the specifics because I don't have my oral uh, history in it, but there, there was a dollar figure. There's a recognition that it was richly textured land, uh, not entirely undevelopable by any means because you can develop any land nowadays. If, if you look at the steep slopes below Arch Beach Heights that are looking out in this direction, you'll see houses built on, you know, stilts on very steep land that increases the value of the property. But the value of the, the green belt in terms of dollars was also another factor which is called what we call the additive value or the enhancement value. You have an actual dollar value for the land and let's just say it's a billion dollars, okay? Because it is some of it's goat grazing and some of it's flat valley bottom but in a floodplain a lot of other places are developable. But then when you take that and you add it as like a gilded frame on a painting, which is what it essentially does as it envelops the city and separates it from the rest of the urban uh, part of, the, of the, Los An the greater Los Angeles basin, the value skyrockets because of that enhancement. And likewise, it casts greater dollar value on the developable portion of the city. If I may add on to that, um, Eric, emphasizing your last point, uh, the other cities around here wish they had a part of it now that Laguna has it all, and it's a buffer, a real buffer, an actual buffer, not a mental buffer. It's a physical one. And the other cities uh, take benefit of using it from their side, their entrance, but it's pretty much Laguna Coast, Elisa Wood Canyon, um, Jim Dilley did a phenomenal projection forward to get us into this mindset to have this buffer. 
What other city did that? Thank you. But at the same token, we need to be very fair to our neighboring cities. And, and Harry knows this very well. The funding source that operates the vast majority of the green belt, not all of it, but the vast majority of it is the county parks department. The city owns a lot of the land, which it leases to the county. The county operates it. And the source of funding is County Service Area Number 26, formerly known as the Orange County Harbors, Beaches, and Parks District, which it receives its principal source of revenue from the property tax, an increment on every single parcel of property, uh, property tax bill in the entire county. So money that is operating the green belt around Laguna is actually coming from, you know, Placentia, Los Alamitos, San Clemente, San Juan Capistrano. Just so you know, the money is, and and that's why everybody is invited to come and use it. And there's a, in terms of the drawing power, there's people that come, just like the, the number of people that participated in the march in 1989, they came from all over the county as well. But I just want you to know that everybody's property tax bill in this county is accruing money into that special district that funds the operation of the green belt. I, I just wanted to um, weigh in just one last thing about value. Um, I, th I think the nature of, of the question partially was the, what, what is the value of beauty? Because when we drive through the canyon, we see this space, there's just an intangible value to that in the same way that there's the same value to big trees in town and you, you can't necessarily measure how high it is and how wide it is or how old it is to get the value. But there's there's a definitely a value there that uh, people can recognize and appreciate and it affects not only the, the property that that's uh, accrued to but the everybody else in town that sees it. Hello. Um, can you tell me, this took how many years, and were there any sort of roadblocks along the way? Was there anything frustrating to you that it didn't go through pretty easily? So, but I don't there's know, over, it seven years? There's well over 100 parcels of land. Uh, I think in Aliso and Wood Canyons, there may be as many, don't, don't hold me to the numbers, but I think it's something like 47 separate parcels of land that make Aliso and Wood Canyons Wilderness Park. Each one of them was a separate negotiation. Each, each one of them was acquired from a different landowner, uh, generally speaking. The oldest parcel, the very first parcel that was acquired in the entire Greenbelt was a parcel on top, uh, near the top of Niguel Peak in Laguna Niguel at the top of Pacific Island Drive, and that was approximately 1970. The very, the next parcel was a 20-acre parcel behind Emerald Ridge on the South Laguna Ridge Line. It's interestingly that the first parcels uh, accrued be on the South Laguna Ridge Line, and that was <clears throat> probably largely due to, in part to the Aliso Creek Task Force that Bob was involved in, uh, in building the recognition of the importance of Aliso Canyon and its contributing slopes, and also to the determination of the Civic South Laguna Civic Association, at which time whose members included legendary planning uh, uh, people like Francis Dean, who helped found Ekbo Dean Austin Williams, a.k.a. E-Daw, uh, Fred Lang, uh, a highly respected landscape architect, and others, including Anne. Um, yeah. But, you know, you, you, it, it wasn't easy. I mean, there were, there were some, Aliso and Wood Canyons, for example, the initial 3,400-acre dedication from the Aliso Viejo Company, which was a subsidiary of the Mission Viejo Company, was negotiated in my living room at 463 Bluebird Canyon when two vice presidents showed up at my front door on a Saturday morning unannounced <laughs> to duke it out with me, okay? But it didn't happen overnight. I mean, 
they wanted to divide it into phased dedications that were tied to we build 2,500 units, we give you this 500 acres, we build the next 1,700 units on this ridge line, we'll give you this 700 acres. It was very, very complicated and very stressful. And even some of the purchases were stressful because there were private inholdings, uh, for example, that were held by the fourth generation of a family that, whose ownership of the parcels could have gone back to the homesteading days. And it took a lot of sorting out to do. It was a very, very complicated process. Anne, you had something to add? Oh, yes. Well, I was hired by Fred Lang to work on the South Laguna General Plan in 1971. And he was restoring the Civic Association to vitality. He had been the president at one time and kind of let things lapse. But a proposal came up to develop a two condominium towers and a mobile home park on the slopes behind the hospital. If you can imagine how that would have fit in. And they were going to take streets down First Avenue and down Third Avenue to serve the traffic from that new development. And and so he, he got on his horse at that point and said, I'm going to dedicate a a general plan for South Laguna, and he got uh, Pete Fielding, uh, Alvin Wheely, who used to work with Pereira, he's a landscape, uh, an architect who studied under Frank Lloyd Wright to direct the planning effort to create this general plan for South Laguna. And it was really quite revolutionary because he went to the Orange County Planning Commission, we were not in the city at that time, and volunteered to donate this plan and amazingly, they accepted his offer. They had no idea what they were getting into by accepting that offer. <laughs> and so for several years, Fred and I and, and Al and the rest of the South Laguna Civic Association worked on this. And we had to deal with the property owners north of Aliso, the Esslinger family, and as well as a number of property owners in addition to the Pat Rayburn one with the condo in the mobile home park uh, on the ridge of overlooking the south side of Aliso. And the whole concept of saving open space was totally foreign to everyone we were speaking to. And they wanted to have roads that went up the hillside and build lots like, like a nice place, like nice place. And and Civic Association and Fred and everyone else just kept pounding on it. And so we ended up with houses on the ridge which should not be visible from Coast Highway, by the way. They're, it's in your imagination to see them up there. <laughs> but we wanted it set back about another 100 or so feet, maybe 150 feet from the edge. And if we'd been able to achieve that, those houses would have almost disappeared. But you're dealing with the County Board of Supervisors, and this was as good as we could do. And uh, how we translated that into county policy was that in 1979, the Board of Supervisors ordered what they called a modernization of the county's general plan. Uh, and uh, there were small teams at the county that were assigned to write and rewrite and modernize various components like the transportation element, the flood control element, the social services element, etc. And I headed up the open space and the recreation element rewrites. And we created the concept of high priority open spaces. And we just drew big blobs in the you know, the Chino Hills, where there was effort underway that ultimately le led to Chino Hills State Park, the Laguna Greenbelt, the Bolsa Chica, the Upper Newport Bay <clears throat> Ecological Reserve, the Caspers to O'Neill Park areas, or a buffer along the whole base of the Santa Ana Mountains. And the Board of Supervisors adopted these high priority open space areas that subsequently translated into proposed regional parks in the county's master plan of regional parks. That's how we worked it, stepped it down through the policy making decision, essentially to the point that when 
the planning commission at the county and the board of supervisors, if a matter was appealed to them, they had to make their decisions consistent with their own general plan. Likewise, at the same time, for example, we designated all of the military sites in the county as proposed regional parks, Tustin Lighter than Air Station, El Toro, Marine Corps Station, Seal Beach Naval Weapons Station, Los Alamitos, et cetera, et cetera, as proposed regional parks in the event that the Department of Defense ever surplus them. And that was written in the boilerplate in the appendices and the Department of Defense never caught it and it was approved by the Board of Supervisors. Mile Square Regional Park is a former military base. We have the Great Park underway today. We have a, a regional park being established in t at the Tustin Lighter Than Air Station. So that's the, the policy part of setting into place. If you don't have your policies in place, you can't force the decision makers to make decisions consistent with what those policies are. So that's, that was very helpful in forcing the Irvine Company to dedicate land outside of what we purchased from them and other developers like Elise Oviedo Company and so forth. Let, let me jump in just for a moment and, and recount some of the history that most of us know. Um, it was in the middle 70s that a development company wanted to put some 2,000 homes on Sycamore Hills. We called it Sycamore Hills, it's now Dilly Preserve. And the city bought that land uh, for three or four million dollars, which was a substantial sum of money after having acquired the main beach just before that, a few years before that. Uh, next uh, big project was, was the Irvine Company's plans in the canyon. Now, uh, Mark has documented, and we've talked about the the walk out to to Dilly Preserve to Sycamore Hills. But the plan uh, at one point was to build 8,000 homes and two golf courses, 36 holes, and it evolved into two golf courses and 3,000 homes. And at that point, in late 1989. Thanks to the awareness that was created by the Tell Project of Mark and Jerry Birchfield, um, all those people walked out, nine to 11,000 people. And within a very short period of time, this has been recounted briefly here, the city was negotiating with the Irvine Company, and we paid for, uh, for, for that land. We paid for it out of city funds, some of it, and we paid it for it with um, with a passage of of, of, a, of a resolution to raise twenty million dollars that we paid out of our property taxes. That was Measure H, and the, the, the bond. And the final part, there was a final parcel that we, we were, the city was having trouble paying for. The Irvine Company dedicated. Um, to the to the green belt, probably in cognizance of the fact that they didn't want to see another ten thousand people walking out there to to keep it green. And today, as you look as you go out in the uh, canyon toward the end of the canyon, there's a project going on behind the hills, and you may have recognized some development at the top of those hills as you go into the Irvine part of the canyon. A couple of years ago, um, the Laguna Canyon Foundation, Hallie Jones and others, negotiated with that company to be certain, because we had an agreement, that there would be no homes visible to anybody driving out in that canyon. And as you look out there today, you don't see the homes, but if you go behind it, you're seeing a lot of homes being built. So this, we were all involved in that. and. Um, it was contribution coming from different directions all over the county. And I have to say, you know, you're sitting in this room where every week there are several meetings going on, planning commission, design review, city council, week after week after week, and in almost every one of those, there are policies being made that take these things step by step, and it takes the persistence of a saint to go to those, speak up, nudge it just a little bit further, 
in the direction of preservation than it would have been without your presence. And I just urge you to do that because we'll keep on making progress if we do that. And let me mention just one more, one more thing that people may have forgotten about. In the late 70s, the Lagoon and Greenbelt hired a lobbyist. Uh, he later became uh, director of a um, large environmental organization in Wyoming. And our goal was to establish a national regional park that was to encompass all of the land even more than what we have today, with the federal government uh, establishing that park. And we had legislation going through the, through, the, uh, through the Congress, and we had our senators, and we had our local congressmen pushing that. Uh, it collapsed in 1980 for a number of reasons, which you can speculate on, but the state stepped in and purchased Crystal Cove Park. That was part of our national regional parks. That was a big segment and very important. I, I'd like to uh, just say another one last thing on my part. Uh, I think what Ann brought up about the topography and the homesteading of the town, it should not be un understated uh, because the quirkiness of the town is is really its arti uh, I mean that's its current artistic legacy. It's why people like it so much, and it's because there were these individual parcels that were homesteaded that might have been big enough for say 50 lots or something, and one homesteader might have had a curvilinear design to their streets, like over by the high school, below the high school. Somebody else might have had small lots, like down in South Laguna. And there's all sorts of uh, artistic and quirky things that make this place so special. Like, uh, I mean, a very small quirk is my own house on, on Brook Street. And people sometimes say, this is weird. Why, why do you have one property line not perpendicular to the street? And all the, all the other property lines on the street are perpendicular to the street. Well, a after doing some of this research, that's a true north-south line, which happened to be the edge of that homestead. So when that person laid it out, he had one oddball lot, which was our lot, so it's a triangle. And, and, so, and you can see that, tr that odd north-south line corresponds to several streets in the Oak Street and Thalia and so forth. So anyway, everywhere you look around this wonderful place, there are funny little things like that that are unpredictable, unplanned, and um, that they all really combine to make this a really unique place. If I could uh, give one final cheer to some people in the background that you may or may not know helped uh, with some of the projects uh, at the county level, an EA that was working for uh, General Riley, uh, Peter Herman, he was a star in the background. Nobody knew, well, a few of us knew, but he was making things work with the developers. And then another name that you may not know, Jose Feliciano. <laughs> I know, out of left field, it's just like Laguna. Suddenly, what's that? He's the man who did the recording that got 8,000 people's attention on the radio when it ran on 11 radio stations for three days in a row Every hour, his broadcast was felt throughout the county. That's how we got so many people there. Jose Feliciano. Do you, uh... Hi, I agree that um, while you can try to place a dollar figure on the value of the land, um, in truth, there is no number that you can attach to the value of the net land. But that being said, I want to commend all of you for the, the work that you've done to preserve it and make it what it is today. But going forward, um, what do you see as the biggest threats to the Greenbelt and what needs to be done to address those? Well, one of them would be fire, you know, the ravages of uh, natural processes. Um, 
Uh, but part of the reason why the, the, the mountains surrounding Laguna are so steep in some places, like at the ranch in Aliso Canyon, is because of dramatic previous slides that have caused the, the slopes to become steeper. Um, natural processes, erosion from giant storms. Um, but fortunately, there aren't any subdivisions out there to suffer through it, so the land will continue to be reshaped. Um, parkland, county-owned parkland, is protected by the County Park Abandonment Act of 1959. It cannot be abandoned. It cannot be exchanged. Much of the land that was purchased and dedicated is deed restricted so that if there was any attempt to sell it, it would revert automatically to the party from whom it was originally purchased or dedicated from. Um, there's other built-in mechanisms as well. Harry, you might have some other things. I'd, to... I'd like to mention something else about it. That One of the things that Eric mentioned, too, is that there were many other people who participated in preserving the land with their property taxes, with their participation in the walk or their construction of the tell or their sending photographs and all of the, the activity there. But they are also beneficiaries of this wonderful donut that we live in. Uh, even the fishermen, when, when the marine preserve was put in place, the commercial fishermen screamed bloody murder. And now they're very thankful that we've created a nursery to replenish fishing supplies elsewhere. But throughout the area now, we're, in, we're at risk of loving it to death. Mm -hmm. We have to learn to, to live with this beautiful open space that we've created, and we have to learn to find a way to encourage visitors who come here, rightfully so, to be able to use it respectfully and not do, I mean, we face the same problem with the national parks and other things. So I think dealing with that is a serious threat to this wonderful natural green belt buffer that we've created. Yeah. Thank and you, I think Mark. The, the, uh, Eric implied that there is a budget required to supervise and maintain our open space. And that is always in flux. And so we have to watch very carefully that we do have enough rangers, enough staff, enough uh, people monitoring the condition and the protection of the open space. I think also we have right now in more, in more uh, jeopardy is the town. And the town is part of this very important picture. And there are intense pressures on development in our city. Um, just tomorrow night at the Planning Commission, we'll be discussing the Historic Preservation Ordinance. And we've been working very hard to continue to preserve the structures in town that are historic resources. And they're rewriting the Historic Preservation Ordinance. And that is uh, all those buildings that give the Laguna character, that give the, the village feel are in jeopardy. Those would some would be very vulnerable to being snapped up, torn down, and converted to a much larger, more impressive um, dwelling. And so, in order to keep the character that we have and that we love, we're going to have to all pull together to not have everything we want in our own personal environment in lieu of having everything we want in the whole city and looking at it that way. I wanted to build on Mark's comment, and thank you, Mark, for bringing that up, that uh, we're going to love it to death. But in that same vein, to answer your question most directly, we have to focus on multiple uses of our parkland that we did not foresee a few years ago. Bikes never were thought of in, in the 80s. I mean, not that much, very little. Now they're a main focus for some kids. There's Now there's, what, hoverboards coming and other things? Uh, I mean, we don't even know, but we have to stay focused to see that people don't destroy the parkland by overusing it and not developing some uh, protocol, some respect for the land. If there were only one word answer, I would say it's education for how to protect the land and get people to, uh, to get on board with that. That might be one of our biggest challenges. 
And another component of that is the ongoing habitat restoration projects. There's grant funding that comes uh, to the county through various sources, such as the California Coastal Conservancy, uh, that provide money to buy land, but also to do habitat restoration. And, and that's going to be an, a never-ending project. I mean, it's a giant project to get rid of Arundo grass in Aliso Creek, but it's going to still be coming down night from 19 miles away in Lake Forest forever. So there's, there's always going to have to be habitat restoration going on uh, uh, in the different plant communities, whether it's chaparral, coastal sage scrub, riparian. Every time you have a giant storm and you lose some slopes in Aliso Creek, uh, upstream of the coastal treatment plant, They've got to do a lot of sometimes remedial grading, uh, revetment, then that calls for being dressed up with habitat. Uh, so that, that's an interesting part of it too. Let, let me just uh, support <clears throat> Mark's, Mark's point and, and the others about the overuse. I was in Laurel Canyon last week and uh, I was at just the intersection of, of the trail that runs along parallel to the Canyon Road and, and, the, and the trail that runs up to Laurel Canyon and three bikers, uh, all with Australia across their, emblazoned across their shirts, came along and they turned their bikes in the direction of Laurel Canyon. There's a sign saying no bikes. And I called to their attention that this was not for their use and they said, well, we're going to do it. We don't care. This is the problem. Uh, Laguna has been identified, the green belt has been identified as one of the, uh, perhaps the second best area for mountain bike riding in the world. And it's attracting people from all over. And I think counties having trouble dealing with that. We're having trouble finding ways to, to contain that usage. And there are a lot of people out there just walking as well. So the overuse is, is a problem. Um, I think that's enough. The, we have the um, one of the one of the projects uh, that Elizabeth Brown and the Greenbelt are working on is the wildlife corridor, which is to connect the Greenbelt to the open space up above, the Irvine Open Space uh, Reserve, and. That entails getting under the freeways, and it ties into the Great Park, which is also a part of all of this in a way, because we're interested in in, in open space that extends from the mountains to the to the sea, and uh, so pay attention to that. Um, Elizabeth has a a grant to work on that, and uh, she's working with the developers. And there are projects in the in the Great Park that may cause impact and problems on the open space areas as well. I was just reading a newspaper article in the 1960 newspaper, and they were recounting that there were two mountain lions legging their way up West Street in South Laguna, 1960. So that really ties into this wildlife corridor idea, you know, the necessity for the strata of predators to keep all the wildlife in balance. And that, so the wildlife corridor that links to Cleveland National you Forest is really close? important. Want to bring it too close? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to express our appreciation for your being here and uh, to encourage you to to take a good look at our book uh, all of the documentation that was submitted to the library of congress is going to be open access to the public perhaps in two years they're behind in getting it up there but uh, we put it together so that you could have access to it and really the idea was that you could show it to your family to your friends and help us maintain this legacy of the past and respect it and carry it forward into future generations. That's what our project was all about. Thank you so much.
I want to thank <clears throat> Ron and his uh, distinguished and very hardworking committee. Thank all of you for joining us. Please join us in May. And Jane, I said I should have written this down. It was the Sinclair family and St. Saint, Clair. Saint yeah, St. Clair family and the Sinclair family. Uh, so look at our newsletter for the dates and all that. Uh, good night, everybody. <laughs>